out of the way, I would like to welcome Tanika Johnson. Tanika is a program developer, trainer, and entrepreneur with over 15 years of nonprofit management. Best known for her curriculum development, organization, and facilitation skills, Tanika has created and facilitated trainings around sexual assault prevention, intimate partner violence prevention, motivational interviewing, substance abuse prevention, opioid overdose prevention, cultural humility, HIV slash AIDS, and marijuana in the teenage brain. Tanika is a dynamic speaker and motivational advisor who brings energy and light to her work as the sexual and domestic violence training specialist at the Massachusetts Department of Public Health in the Division of Sexual and Domestic Violence Prevention and Services. Um, just one final reminder, please meet your lines. Um, I actually have some uh, from Zoom. I can mute your lines as well. So if you, you can always unmute yourself, but I'll go ahead and do that. Thank you. No problem. <laughs> all right, so we're, we're all right to go ahead and get started? Yes, we are. All right, well, welcome everyone. Um, as Ariel mentioned, my name is Tanika Johnson, and I'm going to be taking you through today's presentation around child sexual abuse prevention. So, of course, we're talking about a topic that can be triggering emotions, um, both expected and maybe some unexpected emotions. So, I really want to Make sure that you do whatever you need to to take care of yourself throughout the presentation. And you are the uh, best person to decide what that something would be. So just make sure that you're taking care of yourself um, throughout the presentation. So today we're going to, just an overview, what we're going to be talking about, um, we're going to be looking at some definitions and talking a little bit about the prevalence of child abuse in general and um, a little bit around um, the specifics around child sexual abuse. We're going to spend some time um, going over some general warning signs for abuse and perpetration, um, looking at youth with problematic sexual behaviors, and we're going to spend some time talking about how to respond um, to different types of scenarios that could potentially um, come up in, during programming with youth. Um, we're going to talk, spend some time talking about creating a culture that promotes safety within an organization, talking about disclosures and reporting. Um, of course, we're going to be talking about resiliency. And then um, we do have a toolkit um, that I'm going to mention a little bit about how you might be able to um, have access to that um, at a later point in time. So um, just to begin, so we're all starting on the same page. Just want to establish some common language. Um, child abuse and neglect. For this presentation, we're going to be looking at it as the maltreatment of someone under the age of 18 by an adult who is caring for that child, such as a parent, caregiver, or a teacher. Um, child abuse and neglect can be more broadly defined as any type of cruelty inflicted upon a child, including mental or emotional abuse, physical harm, neglect, sexual abuse, sexual exploitation, and child labor trafficking through um, also through child um, sexual exploitation. In regards to um, a child, we are referring to anyone who's under the age of 18. For the sake of this presentation, you may hear me use uh, youth, young adult, and adolescent. Um, they're also included in this term, um, children. So I might be using them interchangeably. If you do see me, and I think that they're on one of the slides coming up, I think I mentioned child and adolescent. In that case, I'm referring to adolescents as teens. So for child sexual abuse, I'm referring to any sexual activity, touching and non-touching between an adult and a child between adolescents or between two children of significantly unequal power or development. So in that, it may be um, a young person who might be um, five years age difference, three years age difference, depending on the size, um, but also to just the of size difference as well, physical uh, size difference as well. Um, for perpetration, we are referring to people who use abusive behaviors, and that can be an adult, 
an adolescent or a child who carries out the abuse of a child, whether it's emotional, sexual, or physical. We will be talking about some general child abuse and neglect, but for the sake of the bulk of this presentation, we will be focusing on child sexual abuse. So one other definition we have is the definition of consent, which is really important for us to discuss, um, especially for Massachusetts, which is uh, the consent age is 16 years old. So individuals age 15 or younger in Massachusetts are not legally able to consent to sexual activity, and such activity may result in prosecution for statutory rape. Massachusetts statutory rape law is violated when a person has consensual sexual intercourse with an individual under the age of 16. Are there any questions at this point? So one of the things um, I have to say about me as a, as a facilitator, I do tend to um, speak quickly and I like to move through the material. If at any point in time I'm, you feel like I'm moving too fast for you, if you can let Ariel know um, and I'll, I'll definitely slow down. Let me know. So, as for your question, as to is if there were any questions on the chat, there is none. So, great. Thank you. No problem. All right. So, we have a uh, interactive poll. Um, so, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a statement, and I'm hoping that you could either decide, yeah, oh, they're already popped up. Great. So, if you could complete the poll and press submit, that would be great. So, for the statement, I'd like for you to answer whether you agree, you disagree, or whether you are unsure. That's awesome, Ariel. Thank you. No problem. So Let me know when you want the um, poll to end, and I can launch the results so that everyone can also see. Great. Thank you. All right, maybe uh, we can close the poll. All right, so children often minimize and deny rather than embellish what has happened to them. Agree, absolutely, right? So oftentimes children don't even know that what they're experiencing is wrong, let alone attach titles such as abuse um, to it. Um, there has been a 66.9% increase in the number of reported cases of child abuse in Massachusetts between 2012 I and mean, um, 2016 with a total of 32,093 reported cases in 2016. And so uh, I guess a bulk of you um, say agree and some of you are unsure. It is actually true. So it is agree. And, and the key here is um, reported cases of child abuse and this can be correlated to an increase in awareness and disclosures not necessarily um, an indication of an increase in child abuse so for three all people who abuse children are considered to be pedophiles 89 percent of you disagree and that is the correct answer right so with pedophilia it is a diagnosed mental disorder um, and it is a particular type of child molester. Everyone who molests children are not, or abuse children, are not um, pedophiles. Good. Um, boys have a higher child fatality rate than girls. So kind of a little uh, split here. So 33% agree, 11% disagree, and 56% are unsure. So boys do suffer uh, higher child fatality rates than girls. So boys are often suffer high degrees of physical abuse, 
which has a greater risk for child fatality. Does anybody have any um, questions around any of these statements before we move on? I don't see any questions in the chat room. Great. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and move on. So let's talk about, okay, sorry, <laughs> my PowerPoint is stuck. <laughs> there we go. All right, so let's talk about um, some of the young people who are, are sitting at, have some of the highest risk. And so we're talking about um, young people who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, and or transgender, or identify as queer or questioning. Um, young people with physical disabilities that are blind and visually impaired, deaf and hard of hearing, or have cognitive and intellectual disabilities. And children with disabilities are two to three times more likely than children without disabilities to experience abuse. And this is um, due to a num um, the number of caretakers um, that children with disabilities tend to have. So they tend to have a little bit more or higher numbers of caretakers. Um, and then also to children of single parent households. Um, and this, their risk is, is heightened for the same reason for youth with disabilities, just that they find themselves um, with a number of different caretakers, um, which poses a, a risk for um, child abuse. So next we have um, the general signs of abuse in youth with problematic sexual behaviors. I believe on Tuesday, Ariel emailed or made available two handouts for everyone. Um, one of them was uh, a tip sheet from Stop It Now, warning signs of possible sexual abuse in a child's behaviors. And then the other one was a sexual behavior chart um, basically what this chart does is it uh, kind of categorizes um, sexual behavior that can be exhibited in young people. It breaks it down according to age and according to whether or not that um, behavior is normal sexual development, um, sexual behavior problem, or whether or not it's sexually aggressive behavior. And so what I'd like for you to do is to take an opportunity to look at these two handouts um, spend some time looking at them in conjunction. So I'd like for you to, to view them alongside of each other and begin to make the connections between the warning signs and um, what is normal sexual development versus sexual behavior problems and um, what could potentially be sexually aggressive behaviors. And this will assist you in determining um, interventions, which, will, which we will visit um, in more depth in the slides um, ahead. So if you can just take maybe uh, three, three minutes um, to look over those two. Okay, thanks, Mark, for sending. All right, so when we're talking about perpetration and people who use violence, we, we are, there's not a prescriptive way, um, you know, there's not a one size fits all. It can be an adult, a child, all genders, no gender, abusive behavior may vary as well as their motivations. So it's not prescriptive, it's representative in all cultures, it's just not a one size fits all. Some of the warning signs of perpetration, definitely the relationships with children. So they might turn to a child for emotional or physical comfort by sharing personal or private information that would traditionally be shared with an adult. They may often have a special friend, um, a child's friend that may vary um, a change from year to year, and they may spend a lot of their spare time with children. Some sexual abuse is opportunistic, and so, however, most do involve like grooming or luring on a child over time. So they may babysit for free or may volunteer to take children on special outings alone. They may uh, have secret interactions with youth or spend excessive time emailing, texting, or calling. They may insist or manage to spend uninterrupted time alone with the young person. They may seem too good to be true, um, encourage secrets with children. They may buy children gifts or give them money for no apparent reason. And they may allow youth to, to consistently get away with inappropriate behavior and programs. So youth who exhibit problematic sexual behaviors, 
Um, oftentimes, you know, it's important to note, even before we get into um, the slide, that children and youth who display sexual um, problem, problematic behaviors may do so for different reasons than adults who use sexual violence. These behaviors in youth may be a result of other issues, um, impulsivity, uh, family trauma, a deficit in socialization, um, child abuse, um, they may sexually harass or enforce uh, sexual interactions, both direct or non-direct with another young person. Um, they may view sexual images of children, but it's important to note that there has not been a correlation found between youth who display problematic sexual behaviors becoming more likely to use sexual violence as an adult, right? But they may not be able to control some of their behaviors. Um, they may be persistent even after told to stop. Um, and we're gonna, we'll talk a little bit more in depth um, as we go throughout this section. So how do you respond? And I think that this is really, this is really the question. Um, you know, it's important to note that behaviors exist on a continuum. Um, and I really would like for us to really look at expanding our notion of intervention in both of those directions. So oftentimes we, are, we won't intervene until we feel like it's harassment or we feel um, like it's not mutual, or we feel like um, it's abusive or violent. Um, but I would like for you to uh, consider interventions along the continuum because there may be many different factors that influence sexual behavior. So on this continuum, as you noticed in the beginning, we have healthy, age appropriate, mutually respectful, and safe. And then as it goes down, mutually uh, flirtatious and playful, to inappropriate or non-mutual, to harassment, to sexual abuse. So again, if folks can please uh, mute their microphone. So when it comes to responding to youth who display sexual behaviors, there are three uh, main things to consider. One is youth development. So it's important to note that children do not share the same understanding of sex and sexuality as adults, and that adults de um, derive at their understanding based on life experiences, right? Younger and adult years all combined. So the understanding, it's really important to look at the youth development. So in the behavioral chart, that's why we broke it down from age and looking at what is the normal healthy uh, development. The next point to consider is intention, right? There are many different reasons why child, children express sexual behavior. Children, unlike some preteens, rarely express sexual behaviors because of sexual thoughts or desires. And I think that oftentimes when um, young people are presenting uh, or displaying sexual behaviors, the adults in the room see it as, they see it through their own particular lens. So they're seeing it as, a young person looking at it as a the young person is an actual an adult. But the fact is, is that um, they do not um, very rarely express the sexual behaviors based on sexual thoughts or desires. And then the third point is sexual development. And so a child's curiosity around body parts is a normal part of a child's sexual development. And so it's really important, again, to really use that behavioral chart as a guide to kind of determine um, whether or not or where the uh, sexual behaviors actually lie. So we have another um, activity where we'll do a poll. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna be reading out some scenarios and what I'd like for you um, to think about as I read the scenarios is, is the presenting behavior consensual? What is the intention behind the behavior? What is the age and development of the young people who are exhibiting the behavior? What space is the behavior in? Is it in a private space? Is it in public spaces? And whether or not it is actually a cause for concern. And so what I'd like for you to do is to, to use all the tools that you've been given so far. So looking at the warning signs and also using the behavioral chart. As I read out a scenario, I want you to tell me whether or not it is a, um, a green light behavior, a yellow light, or, so a green light behavior meaning something that requires, you know, praise or um, reinforcement. Um, yellow light behaviors, maybe um, you need to 
set some clear boundaries or increase monitoring or maybe consult with other colleagues. And red light behavior is definitely reportable behaviors. Okay. So if you have any questions on what we're going to be doing? No? All right. Thanks. All right. So I'm going to read a scenario. Jennifer and Kendra were seen kissing in the gym. Is this a green light behavior, a yellow light behavior, or a red light behavior? Tamika, I created a poll for all of these scenarios. Would you like me to launch it? Yes. Awesome. Okay. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. All right. So if you could just fill out the scenarios, that would be great. Impressed a minute. Take a couple of minutes. Yes. <laughs> All right. Why don't we close the poll? Sounds good. I'm going to end the poll now and in a second share the results. You see it? Yep. Thank you. Awesome. Oh, all right. So I definitely want people to unmute because we got to definitely talk about these. So I see Jennifer and Kendra were seen kissing in the gym. So 71% of you said yellow, 29% said green. Oh, no one said red. It's not working again. It's not working. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, why yellow? I'd like to hear from folks. Why is this yellow behavior? How old? Are they? And that, that, that's a question that I had. Mm -hmm. Okay, so talk about it more. What ages would this be? So when you're thinking of yellow light, you're thinking that this might be between some young people who... I'm thinking, well, I just automatically said high school because I, I would hope middle schoolers aren't um, kissing in the gym. Um, <clears throat> um, but... Yeah. So if this was, say these are two 16-year-old girls kissing in the gym. Mm. Those of you who said yellow, would anybody change it to green? No. No. Why? Um, I think because um, it's just a yellow light in the sense of um, boundaries. You don't know their relationship in the sense of if you know, one of them was dragged under the in the gym or something like that. So it would probably be a, a boundary thing, uh, kind of check in on them and say, well, probably it's not appropriate in the school anyway, but you know, that kind of thing. Right, so this is more about the space, right? So maybe it's, this isn't behavior that is appropriate for the gym. All right. All right, so a staff person discovered a group of 13 to 15 year olds playing truth or dare in which one young person was trying to convince another to expose their genitals. So this is definitely a red light behavior. Why, why, why is it a red light behavior? Isn't it a sign of like sexually aggressive behavior? Right, or harass, even harassment. Yeah. Right, absolutely. Right. All right, so the last one, Nick who identifies as trans has reported being bullied during the homework group. We have 29% said yellow and 71% said red. So why are you thinking this is a red light behavior? Bullying in, under any circumstance is not acceptable. Right. Agreed. Um, yeah. So this is actually a yellow light behavior. 
And I'll tell you the reason why it's yellow light behavior is because it does have a potential for redirection and um, an opportunity to intervene. However, given the nature of the bullying, depending on um, what has been done, like has it, is it just going on in the school? Has it crossed over into social media? Like what's the extent of it? And that would warrant the move between yellow light into the red light area. So I think that a lot of you were already thinking that it had escalated. Um, and so it's definitely, um, it, in given that regard, a red light uh, behavior. Great, thank you very much for participating in that. All right, so when responding to youth who display sexual behaviors, it's important to contain your affect, right? And speak in a matter of fact manner. If you are shocked and flabbergasted because of youth displaying a sexual behavior, you're sending um, messages to that young person as well. And so um, it's really important for you to be able to contain your affect. You want to make sure that you're stating the facts objectively um, based on what you've seen um, or what has been um, brought back to you. Use it as an opportunity for a teachable moment. Um, in plain language, remind um, the young person the program rules around the behavior that they exhibited. Um, educational materials. So provide information from an age-appropriate educational, educational stance, so like a book or a video and to uh, make sure that you're able to um, offer yourself um, to answer any questions that the child may have, both now and later. Okay. So oftentimes it, they might need an opportunity to kind of process things and may um, want to be able to come back a little later um, to ask questions. So how are folks feeling? Um, this is a check-in. So I'd like for you to maybe take three uh, deep breaths or stand up and stretch. Um, just to kind of decompress a little bit before we move on. Good. All right, so some of, spend some time talking about some of the conditions that allow for abuse. And so uh, secrecy is one of them. Um, if you, if there's opportunity where, um, you know, young people are being encouraged to keep secrets, um, then they're more than likely not, they're going to keep the secret if um, they're being asked to. Um, so you really want to create a culture that um, where secrets are not allowed. Um, lack of reporting um, also. And I think that this is something that has come up in the media. I mean, we've seen um, across child care uh, centers, you know, the, the staff person wanted to report, but the director didn't report and so forth and so on. But if you're working with young people, you are mandated to report. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about reporting as the presentation goes on. Um, failure to believe a child. And so again, this might be if it's coming from a child who has maybe displayed um, their own um, problematic behaviors, um, failure to believe them or whether or not they are a young person who has disabilities or may not be as verbal. Um, all of these also are conditions that allow uh, for abuse to happen. Keeping unwritten rules, right? So it's not something that is a policy. It's not something that's enforced, but, you know, it's just something that's widely known um, amongst the staff. And so I really just want to encourage you that a rule um, is only as good as the rule is enforced. And so if it is unwritten um, and it's not being enforced, it, it really is not a rule at all. And so, and then also to providing opportunities for adults and older youth to be alone or have uninterrupted time with the young person. And so in this, it's really important that um, your programs be set up in a way that's, um, that does not allow for this, right? So whether it's you're grouping your young people according to uh, developmental ages, um, even having policies around what adults are allowed in youth, um, and youth spaces um, and whether or not they're program oriented, I mean, the list goes on, but it's really important um, to make sure that you're not providing opportunities um, for uninterrupted alone time. I wanna also too, just this is 
jogging, I want to make sure that I mentioned mentor programs. And so there are programs where, you know, there is one-on-one -on -one mentoring um, with a young person. And I know that in that, um, these types of things, it, it gets a little bit tricky. And so it's really important just for you to have all the information and making sure that you're using all of the um, systems available to you within hiring, recruiting, um, volunteers, and mentors. So some of the conditions that support safety, the main condition that supports safety, is increasing protective factors in youth. Right? Um, and this is something that many youth programs already are doing and already um, have these sorts of protective factors built into their programs, such as um, having relationships with a caring adult. Right. So staff provide an opportunity to be a caring adult in the lives of the young people who participate in, in programs. Um, academic achievement and feeling like they're able to achieve academically, um, having positive relationships with their peers, um, feeling um, of hope towards the future. So maybe they have some goals set, maybe they know um, what they want to be when they grow up. Um, maybe they can see themselves um, in five years, right? So having um, some hope um, in, in some kind of plan towards their future. Opportunities for civic engagement, and this is, you know, could, could be um, cleanups, park cleanups, community service events. It could be, um, you know, educating younger students around um, hot topics, um, different things like that. Community service as well, so maybe volunteering to read for uh, to younger students or working um, in a volunteer, as a volunteer in an animal shelter. Um, models of healthy behavior. And so this is not only among staff, but also um, within program, right? So what are you serving for snack? Um, are you encouraging young people to exercise? Are you encouraging reading? Are you, what are the types of things? Are you guys actually um, talking about um, health issues that young people face, dealing with stress even, um, the importance of self-care even as a young person, these types of things and creating a culture that promotes safety. And so we're gonna spend the next um, portion of the presentation talking about creating a culture that promotes safety. So in order to create a culture that promotes safety, um, it really begins with values. So having a set of shared attitudes, values, goals, and practices that categorize an institution or organizations commitment toward the prevention of child sexual abuse. Um, organizations should definitely be um, hiring wisely. So utilizing Corey, Sori, interview questions and doing adequate reference checks. Starting at the top and everyone is on the same page. So the first followers and enforcers of any policy is leadership. Leadership should model for staffers. The importance of onboarding and professional development, um, ideally utilizing leadership is also key. Um, how leadership defines and communicates staff expectations is extremely important. They want to ensure that they keep knowledge not trapped in silos, but that if there's a rule, um, a policy, the policy is posted, it's able to be seen, it's talked about during staff meetings, it's talked about in supervision, it's um, talked about um, you know, even, even sometimes with, with parents and with um, the young people within your program, right? It's things that are, are known. Again, um, kind of warding against having unwritten rules and policies. So safety is definitely key and placing child safety as a priority um, is imperative. So recognizing that all the work that we do with young people is for their betterment. Even if you are not a child abuse prevention agency, it is still important to build protections around the young people who are within your care. Um, transparency, right? So again, this goes back to the unwritten rule as well. So ensuring that all policies, rules, and practices are clear and enforced. And if you do have any unwritten rules, make them become some written rules, right? So establish those policies. 
Um, we also want to make sure that in creating a culture that promotes safety, that challenging conversations should be the norm. Right, so it shouldn't be, oh, I'm gonna have to have a hard conversation. Hard conversations should always be part of um, an organization's practice, and not just only within supervision, but all the time, right? So addressing challenges and having hard conversations um, should, when they come up, it shouldn't just be a leadership um, a leadership thing, but it should go across the board. A staff person should be able to say to another staff person, hey, I'm a little bit concerned about, you know, some of the, be, you know, something, you know, they should be able to address it and speak to it. Um, it should be a part of the organization's culture just to raise the concerns and talk through talk, tough topics um, that arise up in programs. And so again, this is the same, you want to empower, you want to empower um, staff from the top down um, that they should be able to hold each other accountable. And again, this is just to kind of piggyback on um, the last point. And, you know, this is something um, that uh, I think that people struggle with culturally. Um, children have a say over their own bodies and you know we do have staff within our programs um, if you have a good program your program is diverse right and so you're gonna have a number of different folks who have varying lengths around the role that children play it's really key um, within your programs to make sure that in the program children have a say over their own bodies so teaching children in your care um, that not only do they have this say over their own body, but everyone else does as well. Um, having a, a organization and culture that values and honors young people's personal space, boundaries and choice, fosters confidence and builds protective factors in the lives of young people. Organizational design. Um, this is definitely key, right? So this is, how we do things, how an organization does things, how things are communicated, what mes messages are sent, and understanding the barriers to learning and sharing um, that exists, right? So our, what are the barriers to learning amongst your staff? Um, what are the barriers for sharing amongst your staff? And, and addressing those on a very regular basis. Again, not uh, being afraid to have those hard conversations. And then also to physical space. Um, and it should also reinforce the culture. And so um, you wanna make sure that you're adopting, implementing and enforcing best practices. Um, and the best practices is that, again, not allowing for adults or older children to have uninterrupted alone time with children. And so, you know, creating spaces where there are always uh, a, a point of a visual point within to a room, right? So, and I think that sometimes this can be challenging for people who do provide counseling, but there are definitely some ways around it. Um, you could make sure that the person who's receiving the counseling is the per person whose back is faced to the door, so there's no face being seen. Um, you can, again, as you can see in the pictures, you know, having um, just the doors that have a, win have a window. Um, if you are in a large um, room, being able to have visual, being able to see from each, from one wall to the other wall, on the left to the right, without having any um, obstructions of view. And making sure that if there are um, things such as bookcases and shelving, that it isn't um, positioned at a height that can seclude um, a child or create a kind of a secluded area. Um, any doors or rooms that you are, are not utilizing should be locked. Does anybody have any questions at this point? I know I've just been kind of going through. I'm trying to be um, mindful of our time. <laughs> any questions at this time? Tanika, I do have a question. Um, this is Ariel. <laughs> oh, um, hi, Ariel. When creating a culture promoting safety, how does this look when incorporating volunteers? Just the same, or is there any additional steps? It should definitely be the same. And I think okay. that that's, that's one of the things I think we, we don't tend to look at volunteers as employees, but we 
hold the responsible responsibility for volunteers as we hold the responsibility for our employees. And so it's really important that we are still utilizing both the quarry and the story with our volunteers and as well as giving them an onboarding and a training process, just as you would with um, an employee. Thank you. Are there any other questions? There is nothing in the chat room box. No. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There were just, uh, there's so much more um, to this that we just really don't have um, time to cover. Um, I really want to, um, I can use as a resource. So the Children's Trust has a really good, um, has really good toolkits around um, creating the physical space. Um, that's conducive to uh, child abuse prevention. So to move along. And so creating a culture of promoting safety, it really starts with you, right? So creating inclusion um, where employees are in, in a better position to contribute, um, making the prevention of child sexual abuse is, is everybody's responsibility. So it's not just the responsibility of supervisors, not just the responsibility of leadership, but it's everybody's responsibility. Oh, you know what? I'm sorry. I'm going to go back to, so one of the things that I, I did not um, talk about, but I want to make sure that I mentioned, I think I talked about it briefly um, when we were going to go, when we went over the overview. But one of the things I want to mention, I think a lot of times we have um, programs where we have um, outside service providers entering into the programs during the timeframes where youth are present. And this is something that I really want to draw your caution um, around. Um, you can um, if you're unable to create a time frame where they can be in the building or in the space where young people are not present, um, it really is um, within your right to talk to whoever that service provider is and get quarry, sorry information around the person who's going to be entering into your program. And that is well within your right to do. A lot of times, um, different programs, I know I used to run a, um, a EEC licensed after school program. And one of the things I just had MOUs with different contract providers. And so I didn't use people who were outside and who we didn't know or weren't familiar with. I just began to create those relationships. And so that really is um, definitely you might, something you might want to consider and it's definitely a best practice. So I know we just talked, asked for any questions though, and there weren't any at this time, but um, this is a check-in. So take a moment to just kind of take a deep breath, maybe do a few neck rolls or stand up and stretch. So, have some information on this. All right, so the next um, thing we're going to talk about is reporting and disclosures. So it's important um, to address and to explore some of the barriers and reluctance um, from young people to disclose um, child sexual abuse. So a lot of times children don't really know how to tell. Um, the lack of general knowledge around sex in a range of sexual activities as well as specific knowledge related to sexual abuse may not be held within a young person. So they may not be able to or know that what is happening is wrong um, or be able to have words to um, verbalize what's going on. Um, children's lack of sexual knowledge um, and again, that children just don't, don't always know that sexual, sexual abuse is wrong. And children rely heavily on adults for social, social cues and norms. And so if their abuser is um, inserting kind of like this is a normal thing, that type of, um, that type of language, it even um, reinforces this barrier even more. Children often try to avoid being distressed or typically um, respond to stress with avoidance, right? So maybe they don't want to overwhelm 
um, a caregiver, or maybe, you know, they'll take on that stress to take on that burden. And that will also, um, is, can become a, a barrier to disclosure. Um, they may feel complacent um, or feeling bad for taking part, right? So even children have shame um, when it comes to um, experiencing um, these behaviors. Especially if there's somebody in their family. Yeah, especially if there's somebody um, in their family, right? And then that's something that we, we definitely see a lot more more of. And I, um, I know in the 80s, it was big on stranger danger. Um, but we do know that a majority of um, instances of child abuse really do happen from someone within their family. Um, children are instructed uh, to not talk to strangers. Again, this is again plays on that same, um, that same type of thing that we just mentioned, right? So if they're taught that this is the types of behaviors that happen from strangers. Um, so when, if it does happen with someone who is a caregiver, they might not identify it as being wrong. Um, children don't want, again, like I mentioned, don't want to trouble the non-offending caregiver. And children also fear the unknown. So what will happen if I, if I tell? What will happen um, if I share? Does anybody have any questions? No, I don't see any questions in the chat, but as a reminder, you all, you all are welcome to plug in your questions in the chat and uh, I'll read them off to Tanika, okay? Thank you. So it's really important when we're thinking about disclosures and barriers and reluctancy um, to consider uh, cultural factors, right? So there are cultural um, elements within culture that protect um, against child sexual abuse, and there are also elements that could reinforce it. And so it's important, again, like I had mentioned, especially around um, cultural um, um, ideas around the role that children play and what children have access to and whether or not children have a responsibility in, or a say over their own bodies. And uh, oftentimes cultural factors play a role in that. So as, as well as shame, right? So um, feeling um, ashamed for participating or feeling responsible for the behavior. Um, taboos and modesty. Um, <laughs> you know, we definitely live in a strongly opinionated society. And oftentimes, um, you know, with young people, there's this dual this du dual messaging, right? So they may be getting messages from media, you know, to, to be out there and to enjoy life, right? Living that best life, um, all of that. But at the same time, they may be hearing from culture or religious, um, religious influences, kind of what it means to be modest or to be chaste, which oh, makes my skin crawl. I'm just saying that word out loud. But these are messages that, that do exist and young people do, do hold them and have to reconcile those um, feelings before they even consider disclosing, disclosing um, any abuse. Um, sexual scripts, so social and learned interactions, so sexual norms around, um, around sexuality, um, there are different types of scripts. Um, oftentimes these scripts are gendered, right? So women in relationships should act like this. Men in relationships should act like this. But this also affects um, young people who identify as trans and non-binary, um, contributing to the restrictions of a gendered sexual activity and social norms. Um, virginity, again, same with taboos and modesty. So there are a lot of cultural influences and religious influences that really put a, um, I guess, a high stake on being a, being a virgin and what that looks like and what it means when you're not, right? So these are also uh, barriers for disclosure, right? This young person would no longer be a virgin, right? So they have to, again, reconcile um, with that. Uh, before they're able to disclose. So, Oblo oh, give me the <laughs> I'm sorry, there's a whole bunch of uh, things happening back here. But um, I can't even talk. Obli <laughs> Obligatory violence. So this is like family or gang gang obligations, right? So maybe there is pressure within a family, you know, to 
be in the family business and the family business involves violence and illegal activity. Or maybe again, a young person is involved in a gang. And again, that carries on, you know, in order for you to participate, you have to do dot, dot, dot. Um, so that's what we're referring to here. Um, notions um, in traditional um, views around honor, respect, and patriarchy also uh, play a huge role um, in the disclosures, right? And so this may be um, if also too, if this happened um, again from somebody who's within their family, right? So what are the implications with disclosure um, if they are to say, you know, that this happened within their family? Are they honoring? Where's the respect, right? And um, I think that these are, again, things that young people have to reconcile. And then lastly, and something that we have um, talked a little bit about in a number of these, is just religious values influencing disclosure as well, right? So again, by saying that you have um, been victimized, um, what is it saying um, from you from a religious standpoint, again, around the, uh, virginity and purity, um, also to what does it mean for who um, you're saying was the person who perpetrated this violence. And so these are all some barriers and reluctancy to disclosure. So in handling disclosures, um, again, as we had mentioned prior about really making sure that you're containing your affect, it's really important that you stay calm, that you believe the child. Um, your reaction is everything, right? So if you have doubt, if you act shocked and surprised, um, the young person is gonna take that in and they're gonna be making some decisions as to whether or not you are a safe uh, person. And so it's really important for you, again, to make sure that you contain your affect. Um, you don't wanna interview the child to determine validity, right? That is definitely not your role. Um, you do not want to give cues or descriptive words to describe what they have shared. You, you know, you pretty much don't want to uh, ask any detailed questions. You want to leave that um, to the folks who are going to um, be uh, reporting, right? You just want to make sure that whatever the young person does share, that you're just thanking them for sharing. Um, you want to keep the child informed of what will happen next, right? So if this is something you're not gonna be able to keep to yourself. You wanna make sure that you let that young person know um, something as serious as this, we cannot keep this to ourselves and share with them what the next steps would be. Um, know that recanting is common among children who disclose. Um, and I think that that is key. So if you hear from a young person that they are experiencing abuse and they recant, your obligation doesn't change. So also uh, with handling disclosures, you want to make sure, um, very similar to um, working with sexual assault um, and sexual violence survivors, you want to make sure that you're using validating statements, right? I believe you. It is not your fault and I am so sorry this happened to you. Thank you for telling me you were brave to share this with me. And we will do everything we can to help keep you safe and get you the help that you need. Do we have any questions? questions. No questions from the chat. All right. <laughs> we're moving right along, and I think that we're going to end up ending really close to time, which is good. So if you suspect abuse, all right, so first, before I even get started, you are a mandated reporter, right? So you are uh, mandated to report any um, suspicions um, of abuse. So you wanna make sure that you report right away into the appropriate agency. So abuse in family, school, or by a caregiver, you wanna call the Massachusetts Department of Children and Families. Okay. If abuse by a non-caregiver should be reported it should be reported via the local police department where the offense took place, right? Only contact the child's parents if you are confident that they are not the ones abusing the child. If you are uncertain about this, letting the parents know could pose a greater risk to the child. So Massachusetts reporting um, requirements. So for child abuse and neglect, it must be reported to DCF, 
um, if and when acting in your professional capacity, you have reasonable cause to believe that a child is suffering certain kinds of physical or emotional injury, such as abuse afflicted upon the child, which causes harm or substantial risk of harm to the child's health or welfare, including sexual abuse. Neglect, including malnutrition or physical dependence upon an addictive drug at birth. So you must, rep uh, the report must be made orally to DCF and then followed up by a detailed written report within 48 hours. So this is a little picture of what the report is and you can find it, you can definitely find it online. All right, anybody have any questions about reporting? Oh, I just breezed right through that. <laughs> but I think that you guys are probably, that might be the piece that you might be the most, most familiar with. Um, so building resiliency, and this again, you know, bringing it back to the young people and bringing it back to um, making sure that their uh, safety is a priority. Um, you want to make sure that you're making connections. So encourage in building and nurturing of friendships. So peer-to-peer -peer and also um, with a caring adult. You want to make sure that your program structure and routine, right, is clear, right? You actually have a program structure and a routine. Uh, most children thrive when there is structure and knowing what to expect in a routine is comforting for children, especially children who have experienced trauma. Um, self-care, right? So teaching the practice of self-care, and this is not only just for staff folks, but it's also for young people, right? So having a little bit of downtime and not making sure that the um, schedule is it so packed throughout the day, right? So that you are scheduling time for transition. If you have a young person who really um, struggles with moving multiple times throughout the day, really taking an opportunity to create a special plan for them that allows for them to move um, within your program structure in, in a way that's most effective for them. Uh, perspective and being hopeful, right? So keeping things in perspective and, and maintaining a hopeful outlook um, for young people is extremely important. And remember, we had talked about this being a protective factor. Um, goal setting and working toward goals, so looking for varying degrees of success and teaching young people to look for varying degrees of success, success even baby steps um, are all movement towards their goal. And then providing an opportunity for them um, to help others. Um, for youth who may feel as if they are helpless, being in a position um, to be helpful uh, can be very empowering. And then lastly, um, providing young people with an opportunity to have positive self-view, right? So again, looking at those different varying degrees of success, um, making sure that young people have an opportunity to feel successful um, at multiple different times throughout the day. So that is my last slide. And I'm gonna open it back up for questions. Anybody have any questions? At this point, you're also welcome to take yourself off mute and ask questions as well. So I will say, um, since there's no questions right now, and hopefully maybe you'll be thinking of some <laughs> as I'm talking. Um, so at the Department of Public Health, um, we are working, are going to be working with sexual and domestic violence programs to um, implement some of these best practices around the prevention of child sexual abuse. And so you will have opportunity um, at some point in time, hopefully sooner than later, um, either this year or next probably, we'll have an opportunity um, to have uh, access to training for your staff, um, as well as access to um, the toolkit that we um, have created um, to assist you. And so, you know, there will be um, some additional opportunities 
um, for you to get in, get involved, to get questions asked, and to um, get some technical assistance around implementing some of these best practices. Yeah. In a deep, yeah, deeper, in a deeper level. Two minutes left. Any questions? <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you for participating. All sorts of thank yous. <laughs> okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, all. Welcome. thank you all for participating. Um, I really do hope that this was helpful. Um, and at any point in time, you, you see on the bottom of the slide, that is my email address. Um, you could definitely, you're more than welcome to email me any, any questions. Full transparency, as you can imagine, my email definitely is gets flooded with um, other projects. So I will say to you all, make sure you put it, set it at high importance, and then I definitely won't miss it. At this point, while we close out, I'm going to send out one last closing poll. It um, helps us know your experience of this webinar. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do that, okay? And then I want to thank our participants and make sure you are aware that it is now 1130 and which is the official ending time of this webinar. Um, thank you so much Tanika and thank you all for um, working with us as we circumvented um, this webinar. So please be on the lookout. Um, please be on the lookout for our last two webinars for the fiscal year. On April 4th, we will be having, um, we will have a webinar with Allie Phillips, who will be talking about the Sheltering Animals and Families Together, or the Safety Initiative. Um, why would you want to check that out? Well, recently, Purina and um, Purina um, Purple Leash and the Red Rover Project announced some grants for folks, for shelters who are looking to incorporate some sort of safe housing for people with pets. Um, and part of that requirement of that grant is to review the, sh the safety initiative manual. So we'll be having Allie Phillips herself on April 4th. On April 25th, we will have Stacey Reed training on identifying youth trafficked for sex. You can register for both of these by logging into your Member Lodge account, and if you need any assistance with that, you can always email me, um, Ariel Valdez. It's uh, avaldez at janedoe.org. Um, thank you all for participating, and have a wonderful day. And um, all the materials for this webinar will be up by Monday. So you all have a good Thursday. Yay. Anything else, Tanika? Nope, that is all. Thank you all for participating.